Oh, Andrea Tessman. Yes, Kirk Buckner. It's Christmas time. Maybe not when people are listening to this, but it's Christmas time 2020 as we're recording. Oh, what were they this doing? is true. Yeah, I wonder what they were doing in Christmas in 1958. Hmm. I have an idea. I do too. I think they were listening to Alvin and the Chipmunks. The. Yes, this is the first. I, w- I stood corrected from you last week. I thought that this was the only Christmas song to ever go number one, which it was until last year. Until last year, which is especially funny because Mariah Carey's All I Want for Christmas Is You came out in what, 92? 95. 95. So it was 15 years almost. Mm-hmm. Before it made number one, it, it's. But we're not talking about no. Mariah Carey. We probably never will. I, I again, I, unless we go on her fat years, that I might want to do. <laughs> no, we're talking about actually, technically, not Alvin and the Chipmunks in theory, because this was not credited to them. This no, was it wasn't. David, it was David Seville and the Chipmunks. David Seville and the Chipmunks. And this was not... A man who didn't exist. No, a man who did not exist. Uh, Although their group is a proud members of the fictitious Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which you can all vote on for the class of 2020, ending this week. A little plug in there. A little shameless thing that (laughs) that I I thought I'd do. It's called cross-promotion, Andrea. Hey, why not? I mean, you put all the work into all of these shows, so you might as well cross-promote them. Oh, speaking of which, uh, apparently we now are 50-50 male-female. We used to be 57% female. I think I'm going to attribute that to yourself. I I think your soothing voice is attracting more of the male demographic. (laughs) Okay. That's the theory that we're going to run with. That's what Evan and I, on the other show, the Hall of Fame show, have come up with. We think it's you. (laughs) Could be. It, or the fact that we're not just talking about sports. I, well, there's that, too. There's that, too. All right. So back to the This chipmunks. guy. Well, I, I, gotta, we, I think we have to talk about this guy first, Ross Bagdasarian. Because I guess Ross, he figured out something pretty, pretty early. Ross Bagdasarian and the chipmunks doesn't work. No. I mean, it could. Um, so before... Before the Chipmunks even came out, he he decided that he would use David Seville mm-hmm. as his name for his studio production stuff. So he released music under David Seville before the Chipmunks were a thing. Um, and the Seville apparently came from him spending time in Seville. That's very complex. <laughs> um, but don't know where David came from, but I think it's just a much easier, more memorable name than Ross Bagdasarian. Um, so he released... Did you did you listen to There's a Bird on My Head? I didn't listen to that, but I, I did not realize just all the other stuff he even did before that. Uh-huh. So he was... Oh, come on to my house? Well... Come on to my house, my house, so come on. Well, yes, by, what was that, yes. uh, Rosemary Clooney, I believe? Rosemary Clooney made it famous. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Written for a play with his cousin, and I'm blanking on his name, but he was quite a famous playwright. So, uh, but yes, Rosemary Clooney and a phenomenal harpsichord uh, line that just is... I don't know how anyone could actually even play it. It's so technically complex. But harpsichord ragtime is its own thing that's very cool. It was also um, acting, also too, weird. which is interesting. I, it, like, I'm not a big fan of films from the 50s, 40s. Like, I, I can't get into it. I find the dialogue a little bit too corny. But a lot of these films that he was in are pretty big films, like Viva Zapata, 
Stalag 17, mm-hmm. I know this, Rear Window. But Yeah, he played the piano player. Yeah. But no that, no idea it was him until I read that a few days ago. But like barely almost everything he ever did was uncredited. So like he mm-hmm. he's been in the he was been in the business for God, uh probably ten years plus. Probably not making a whole lot of money, but I think it's sort of important. Because he, it's not mm-hmm. like he was a virgin to a lot of this stuff, unlike some of the people that we've already talked about, who just were so fresh-faced, not really knowing what to do. Well, he'd already been dealing with record studios. He'd already been dealing with Hollywood in some capacity. Yeah, he wasn't a name, but he knew the game. I wasn't going for her. A rhyme. It, it <laughs> you were happened. going for a rhyme, but it happened. Yeah. But so he he knew he knew the industry. He started playing around with digitizing his sound and mm-hmm. playing with stuff. And this is why I brought up there's a bird on my head. Because so his first number one hit it was The Witch Doctor. Right. Which liberally used that synthesized sound that he he created and then duetted with himself mm-hmm. for for the song, which early in 1958 came in, was the number one hit for like three weeks. Um, but we'll go back to that in a second. But before that, he put out a single called There's a Bird on My Head, or something like that, The Bird on My Head maybe. But basically he's duetting with a bird that's on his head saying how he wants to have a home and the bird is singing saying how he wants to have a wife. It's bizarre. It's a novelty song and he starts to use that that half so that the chipmunk sound is recorded at slow speed and then played at full speed to get the chipmunk sound. So the bird in that original song is it's not chipmunky, but it's definitely a higher pitch tinny sound so he's starting to play with that duet with himself and play with the electronic effects then early in 1958 April I believe he comes out with Witch Doctor my friend the Witch Doctor he mm-hmm. told me what to do um, and I remember this being one of my cousin's favorite songs when they were like three and just learning to talk and it was quite funny um, so then had a number one hit Mm -hmm. for three weeks, realized, hey, I've got something here, and then started playing with it more and came out with the chipmunk sound and then released the Christmas song. The chipmunk song? I can't remember what it's actually called. (laughs) Well, it is. The chipmunk song, and then in parentheses, Christmas Don't Be Late. Christmas Don't Be Late. Please, Christmas, don't be late. And it's brilliant. And I think, I, and I'm glad you sort of set this up, because what he did in the span of those two songs, because novelty songs, if you look at the history of novelty music, you've got Weird Al, Dr. Demento, and everyone else who just sort of like had one, they were one and done. But then um, you forget about how him. about... Everybody was Kung Fu fighting. Oh, uh, but was that... Was, was, <laughs> was that a novelty song? Or is that just a soul song about a novelty the, idea? <laughs> I'm going with it's still a novelty song. Oh. But yeah, you, you come up with this, this random thing that's popular and usually it fizzles immediately. But here's what he did so brilliantly after that. Okay, so we have something. People like it. All right, so let's give them characters. And who did he name the characters off of? Off of uh, the people from the record, from the exec, the record executives at Liberty. <laughs> yeah, the record executives, Alvin, Theodore, and oh crap, what's the other one's name? Simon. Simon. Yes, of course. So that's also brilliant. I think that was quite funny. And do you know that he? Uh, Liberty Records was close to bankruptcy. And he pretty much single-handedly saved the record label with his novelty novelty songs. Not only that, I mean, he pretty much, I don't want to say that he saved himself, but 
he oh, well, well no aside from that he he's been pretty much the only man in history to be the writer artist um composer well, it's like basically composer yeah every single stream of revenue with the exception of the oh producer with the exception of the um actual promoter he basically directed every revenue stream from those songs back to himself which for that era is that is genius and i think that's sort of like why i wanted to mention he was not new to this whole to the hollywood game he'd probably yeah. seen no, he knew what he was doing yeah. he, he probably saw a lot of people sort of screwed over and probably including himself i mean i i don't know for sure but he had that number that big hit with uh, that was done by uh rosemary clooney maybe he didn't make a whole lot because apparently from what i was reading you know he, he the 200 dollar tape recorder the special tape recorder to do all these sounds that he, had he bought, into, it, bought himself out of his savings yeah yeah so he probably was doing okay uh, he had savings so he had something but nothing but like this. But he probably knew how it worked, and mm-hmm. if he used studio equipment to do it, then he would have to pay royalties back to them. But here's the and other, but then the other brilliant thing he did: the cre- he created his own enterprise, Shipmunk Enterprises. He didn't lose uh-huh. any of it, so all the intellectual property stayed with him. Yes, and then the TV shows and the toys and the. He goes on and on. Mm-hmm. Um, so he, yeah, he he created an empire. Yes, of chipmunks based on a very very simple technique of recording music at half speed and then playing it at full or higher speeds and just giving them character it's names. Brilliant. I, just, yeah. the, the one thing, uh, like I've got a, one of my uncles, and I remember hearing this from when my grandparents were still alive. Uh, my, my uncle is uh, now. But I'd be 65. So I remember this as a little kid, my grandmother saying, oh, your Uncle Mike just loved Alvin. And just like the timing, I guess, sort of like fits for that. The big thing of that is just everyone remembering David Seville getting upset. Alvin! And, you know, here's the troublemaking chipmunk. So I, and I maybe mentioned this before to you, but I did not know that the chipmunks were a 1950s, 60s phenomenon. I mean, I I grew up in the eighties, um, and they. So I I discovered through looking at this that uh, they kind of fell off the map in the early seventies, and then Ra- Ross Bagdasarian Jr. Mm-hmm. reinvigorated them in nineteen eighty. So that kind of explains why they were there my whole childhood mm-hmm. as I was growing up. I had an Alvin puppet. It was. I really like that puppet. I don't know what happened to it. Probably gave it to one of my baby cousins. But um, it, they they were part of my childhood. They were, but I thought they were something from the eighties. I didn't realize that they were twenty years older than that. Um, so it was just sort of an interesting thing that he created this empire mm-hmm. with um with a cartoon and with multiple songs and albums and, and the movies toys and movies but then well were there movies in the in the first phase no i'm not sure no but no they, they, they didn't come out till the 2000s Alvin, and then he passed away and the company moved on to his son who brought it back in 1980 and then they came up with like how many movies and and toys and albums and 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 like the multi million dollar empire multi more than multi million dollar mm-hmm. multi million isn't that much anymore but based on freaking cartoon chipmunks like mm-hmm. it's bizarre it's also great. Isn't it nice to sort of like have a great happy ending for once? Yeah, especially <laughs> after the singing nun. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I just, well, I think kung fu fighting is kind of a 
a happy ending because the guy, he, he didn't whine about being just the kung fu fighting guy. No, he just was happy. He makes hundreds of thousands of dollars a year on royalties from it. Good for him. Absolutely. But uh, this might be... You know what? What? This might be what? Well, no, okay, I was going to say, like, uh, oh. one, of, what, what are the other interesting things when you were mentioning how you learned about how that song actually originated in the late 50s? I'm just thinking of pe- of people who are just teenagers now or just who grew up as little kids with the Alvin movies, <laughs> not realizing, oh, there was cart- there was a popular cartoon in the 80s? Oh, there's so many examples of that. It, How about some Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? That's true. That just keeps making a comeback. They just literally won't <laughs> die like from the sewer that they're from. You can't flush those things down the toilet. 20 no, years from now, there'll they be another. The sewers. That's the whole plot line, yeah, Kirk. That's, I know. That's why I was going with that. I know. 20 years from now, there's going to be another Alvin and the Chipmunk resurrection. And why not? They're cute chipmunks. He rosted mm-hmm. everything right. He gave, he gave them personalities. Uh, you know, he, he got the precocious one, the fat one with the, with the heart of gold and, 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 the, and the smart nerd. You know, they're chipmunks. Yeah, you can't no, get mad they, at chipmunks. They are. You look at any, well, I'm going to say 80s, 80s teen movie because that's what I grew up with. But any of those movies, that just fits the perfect dichotomy of friends getting into trouble. You know, 10-year-old boys getting into trouble. You've got the smart nerd. You've got sweet fat one and you've got the precocious troublemaker that was shit that's growing pains <laughs> o- o- yep. o- o- only ben wasn't fat but still still yeah, yeah, he was, well, about it. well he was kind of the other one i mean yeah well, you ever watch that show i did because did, uh, you had a crush on mike siever didn't you not really no. I didn't pay enough attention to it to have a crush on any of them. Uh, I was also a bit young, probably. I, actually, yeah, and then I'm sort of like doing the math in, the, in my head. That probably wouldn't quite work. Uh, this is sort of a quick topic because it's sort of it's it's a happy song. But I thought because I knew it would be quick, we could go over. Okay, but first, what what do you got? I still have to say, I still want <laughs> to <hold my home."> Nice. <laughs> That's all. Which is another fad. Go figure how that worked out. <laughs> I, hey, I have multiple hula hoops. Interesting. Well, I, 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 I don't really move <laughs> myself. They just, I, no. Okay, so you were, this was a short topic. So it was a, it was a short topic. What would you like to go into next? Cr- well, Christmas songs in general. Because I was looking, because yeah. needless to say, I was wrong. Well, I, what, I was right up until a year ago. That this was the only Christmas song that went number one. I just did not re-educate myself as to what transpired with Mariah Carey. But I looked at all the songs that sort of define Christmas for me growing up, and just to see how many of them were actually chart successful. Not a whole hell of a lot. Nope. Now, so uh, I've got a few that that stick to me personally, and. I think not necess- I think because you'd always hear the same stuff over and over. There's not a lot of relatively new songs. Also, now I know in Barbados, I don't hear any of these. They've got their own Christmas songs down here. Although they do have Mariah oh, Carey's. Oh, the beat. Yeah, although the Mariah Carey song is still done here. Oh, that's everywhere. You can't, you cannot escape the Mariah Carey. No, and there's, that, that actually might be a, a film somewhere. You cannot escape Mariah Carey. <laughs> Only that might be sort of like, like a monster flick in a way. But so yeah, these are the ones that either I love or don't necessarily love, but are ingrained into my brain. And you can play the game: did they chart or did they not? All right. Okay. And this is going to be in chronological order, so oldest to newest. Elvis Presley, "Here Comes Santa Claus." I'm going to say it charted. It did not. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I knew you were going to do that. I'm surprised by that. Yeah. Um, 
just because when when did that come up? Fifty seven. Like prime Elvis time. I'm surprised that didn't chart. Yeah, but if they don't release it as oh. a single, technically it can't chart. Ah, can I ask you about Blue Christmas? I didn't put that in my in my memory thing because I never really cared for that one. Ah, uh, there. I'd have to look that up. Anyway. Okay, what's your next one? Well, Chuck Berry's back with Run, Run, Rudolph. Run, Run, Rudolph, Santa's gonna make it to town. Um, I'm gonna say that charted? Yes, it did. And how perfect, considering what we've talked about before, it went to 69. <laughs> Oh, dirty, dirty Chuck. Uh, from from Home Alone, nineteen well, not the, not the, the, the you might remember from Home Alone, but the song just came out nineteen sixty. Brenda Lee, rocking around the Christmas tree. I hope it didn't chart because it's terrible. Oh, it did. Mm. Fourteen, nineteen sixty. Oh, I was going to say fifteen. Oh, sorry. But, yeah. I'm um, I'm obviously not a fan of that song because it's just annoying. But anyway, please continue. All right, uh, this one may uh, Christmas baby, please come home by Darlene Love, and this is sort of a, a topical one for me because this song pretty much got this woman into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So I'm going to guess it did chart. It did not. Wow. Darlene Love, and and all due respect to this woman, great voice, great pipes, uh, is probably the least deserving Rock and Roll Hall of Famer by far, and it's not even close. (laughs) She got got in because little Stevie, you know, from the E Street Band, who has a lot of pull there, just says, get her like Darlene Love. I don't think I'm even far off on that. I don't know anything else that she... Um, she put out. Because there is nothing else. I don't know. (laughs) It's like Percy Sledge, who's the second worst, did When a Man Man Loves a Woman. It's a great song. He didn't write it. He also didn't do anything else that anyone remembers. Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But anyway, Andy Williams, It's the Most Wonderful Time of the Year. Um, I'm going to say did chart. Did not. I think I'm zero for all here. No, I got one. I got Chuck Berry. Anyways, Mm -hmm. continue. The Beach Boys, 1963. Little St. Nick. I actually was recommended the YouTube on this. Shows interesting things on my YouTube thing. And what year? 63? 63. Like, 63 Beach Boys should chart. So I'm going to say it did. It it did not. Fared well over the years. Well, okay, I'm still batting zero. Okay, a song that I loved as a little kid. The Royal Guardsman, Snoopy's Christmas. <laughs> um, did not. It did. Number 15. <laughs> I suck at this game. <laughs> well, it's a good thing there's no prize at the end. Okay, Jose Feliciano, 1970, Feliz Navidad, or as I remembered as a little kid, Fleas on a Dog. Uh, did chart. Yes. Have to have charted. But only in its re-release. Año e felicidad. But it, only in its re-release in 1998 at number 70. Did not chart when it first came out. Did it chart when Bonnie M did it? Bonnie M did that. I oh, don't... Bonnie M did a cover of it, I'm sure. Didn't but I could be wrong. What was the I listened song? to a lot of the Bonnie M Christmas album with my grandmother. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but anyways, they obviously didn't chart. Okay. So, what's next? My personal favorite, technically not a Christmas song, but it's always played at Christmas, but it is my favorite Christmas. My, actually, well, no, sorry, my second favorite Christmas song that I'll be talking about. Happy Christmas, war is over. Definitely charted. Did not. 
What? Oh, man. Okay. The coolest pairing ever, Little Drummer Boy, Bing Crosby and David Bowie, 1977. How do I not know that? I'm going to say it didn't chart, but that totally should have charted. It did not. Look, I got one right. Um, but also, very cool. You never, you never heard that? I probably have, but I'm just not recollecting it at this okay. point. Here, here's your homework. They, they actually did that on, on a Bing Crosby special on TV. So you can actually watch them perform it together. It may or may not have been Crosby's last live, or I don't know if it was live, last TV performance. I can't recall, but it it was near the end. Hmm, interesting. Boney M, Mary's Boy Child, 1978. Charted. No. No. Should have. But as I said, I listen to a lot of Boney M Christmas albums. 12 Days of Christmas by the McKenzie Brothers. This only means something to us as Canadians. No. You're finally no. right. <laughs> I think that's my third right one. Yeah. Yeah, ha- having said that, though, if you were a baseball player, I'd be benching you right now. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently what I like is what the general populace likes. Well, it's not saying what you like. It's, it's just like, did it chart? I know, but I'm generally basing my opinions on what charted based on what I like. Okay. We can look at it that way. All right. My favorite Christmas song, although this appears on a lot of worst Christmas song lists. Do They Know It's Christmas by Band-Aid. I'm going to say it charted, but it also is a terrible song. <gasps> <laughs> Blasphemous. I must be, Come on. I must be wrong on Africa. this. Africa has had Christianity for 1,500 years. They know it's Christmas just because there's no snow. Stop being racist. That's all I have to say about that. Jesus. Maybe I'm just not woke here, Andrea. I guess I don't get it. <laughs> I mean, maybe they were just but they asking... they raised a bunch of money, so... Well, maybe they were just asking it like that rhetorically and ironically. You know what was... You know what was even worse? What? Uh, Maroon 5's cover of it. I didn't know. I've never heard that. Don't. Just don't. It's not worth it. Well, oh, you said you said it charted, right? I'm going to say yes. All right, number 13. I yes. think that's the highest on the charts we've gotten. Uh, du, 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 du. I, I don't remember. All right, here's a, here's a horrible song. Elmo and Patsy. Grandma got run over by a reindeer. I'm going to say it charted just because it's so terrible. I'm sorry for the squeaking. My dog is playing with a squeaky rabbit. Oh, good. I've got, I've got whistling frogs in the background. So, <laughs> Gee. Uh, It did not when it was released, but it went to number 112 in 1992. Grandma got run over by a reindeer. Ooh, okay. Coming home from our house Christmas Eve. Ooh. <laughs> Isn't that song off? Yeah, ooh, it's what I've, what I've got next here. Uh, Wham! Last Christmas. No. Okay, so do you know that there's a thing about, like, when you hear Wham! from December 1st, then you get knocked out of the race and like, you have to try to get through the Christmas season without hearing wham. I've never heard this. I got knocked out on December 1st this year. This is, you asked what my like most and least favorite Christmas songs are. This is the one of the ones that I just find super annoying. Um, and I'm going to guess it didn't chart when it was released. You are, you are correct. You're learning the game. Uh Uh-huh. You know but who, did it chart later? Yes, it did. Number 58 in 1998. Also, yeah, Ariana... Last Christmas. Yeah. Ariana Grande covered current this, current by the Christmas way. I don't want it in current Christmas or the next Christmas. Yeah. I, I will say this. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on a tangent because I can. And you'll rein me in when it's time. 
Did I ever tell you that my true superhero in life is Andrew Ridgely? I have not heard this. You have not? Okay. And so Andrew Ridgely, for those who are, are not aware, he's the other guy in Wham! And Andrew <laughs> Ridgely is the most brilliant man ever. Because nobody ever made so much money for doing nothing other than being in the early 80s, becoming good friends with George Michael, who might have been at that point in time one of the most gorgeous men on the planet. I think I can say that and feel still comfortable in my heterosexuality. But you look back at that. Did you ever see like George Michael in the Wham days, Andrea? Oh, he was a sexy man for sure. Sure. But here's what Andrew knew that we didn't know. George was gay. Meaning, he latched onto this guy who could write songs, who could perform, and then when they performed, he did it all. George Michael did everything. Andrew Ridgely did nothing. Literally nothing. Look at any, any old Wham! video, any Wham! performance. Ridgely does nothing. Nothing. Yet, he, uh-huh. got, he got tagged with a couple songwriting credits that he really didn't do got to see the world, and he got all the, all the punani that George Michael didn't want. Uh-huh. And it gets better. Yeah. It gets even better. He got to race, so he retired pretty much after. He did his little solo album. Do you know that he married and is still married to one of the members of Bananarama? <laughs> no. Yes. I didn't know that. Yes, he is. Interesting. Yeah, uh, and I didn't know he did a solo album because he is a very just unrememberable name. Well, nobody bought it. Like, did you ever see uh, music <laughs> and lyrics? See what? The movie Music and Lyrics. Yes. That's basically Andrew Ridgely. Mm. The only difference is. Yep. The Hugh Grant character still kept trying to do stuff. They even sort of like had the whole Alma, like here's the solo album. They, so they even did that. The only difference is Andrew Ridgely just after that said, ah, screw it. I'm just going to like uh, bugger off with my hot wife and uh, just uh, mm-hmm. live a life of leisure. And that's what he did. And I mean, he's got to live pretty well just off the royalties of mm-hmm. last Christmas. Uh, yeah, I, so, don't, I don't know. So that's why back I, to Christmas music. Yes, that's why Andrew Ridgely is my hero. That's it. Done. <laughs> Christmas and Hollis run DMC. Oh, I'd like it to have charted. I'm gonna say it probably didn't. It did not until it was re-released in 2000. Hmm, that's that makes sense. All right, I got two more. When All I Want for Christmas is You by Mariah Carey was released, did it chart? Did it, not chart. Oh, it probably did chart. It did? So, I'll let yeah. You. Probably want, 20-ish? 12. Oh, okay. That's our highest, yes. Until... Until this one. 2019. Well, well, I have one last one. This one, actually, I okay. actually spoiled it because it did chart. Uh, the Hanukkah song, Andam Sandler. <laughs> that charted above 12? Yeah, 10. Oh, wow. That's just like a terrible, terrible piece of music. But you know what? There's not a lot of Hanukkah songs, so good on him for putting something out there for the Jewish people. That's probably why it, That's probably why he's making some good dough off that. So So you asked... Oh, sorry, yeah. what? Oh, no, I was going to ask you, uh, yeah, what is... Because I asked you sort of like your bit of homework was what is your least... like. Maybe we've already answered it with the least favorite Christmas song. Um, I'm not a big fan of Grandma Got Run Over by Reindeer. Mm-hmm. Um, I loved it as a kid, but it's not nearly as amusing now. Um, Wham can go fuck themselves. <laughs> uh, though I, I like your reason for liking them. Um, I just, that song is. Well, I, I, did, I didn't hell. say that I necessarily liked a lot of stuff Wham did. I just said Andrew Ridgely is my hero for mm-hmm. doing absolutely nothing 
and just realizing that he could milk an entire life off befriending a gay guy. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a ton of terrible Christmas music out there. Um, and so it's like, okay, if you're asking me which of the big hits I'm annoyed by, I'm going to say Rockin' Around the Christmas Tree. Um, I, I don't think anybody should ever listen to Mariah Carey sing Oh Holy Night because it's just grandstanding the entire mm. song and well as you'd expect it's Mariah Carey singing Oh Holy Night um did you know that there's a song by Tiny Tim of ukulele tiptoe through the tulips fame mm-hmm. Tiny Tim called Santa got AIDS this dot got Santa's got the AIDS for Christmas seriously <laughs> Basically saying Santa come can't come around this year because he's sick because he's got AIDS, and apparently it was written and recorded in 1980 and released in 1990, and this is just so much cringe that it's just so I gotta, wrong. I gotta find that. Um, oh, just just YouTube it. It's there. Uh, Tiny Tim, Santa's got AIDS. Um, and then, and people accepted it, even though it was well into the AIDS pandemic, epidemic, whatever you want to call it. A lot of people were dying. Um, and then... That, that might be the worst um, taste song ever. It might be. There's a high chance of that. Damn. Um, How did I not know about this? <laughs> I'm glad I could share with you. Yeah. Uh, there's there's some other really terrible Christmas songs. Um, there's Backdoor Santa. I'm sure you can imagine what that's about. I, I think I, I am familiar with that. Yeah, I, I believe I believe that's Bon Jovi. I, I, I gotta say, like anytime you're sexualizing Santa, I'll, I'll give you mine if if, you, if 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 you're ready for that. My least favorite. Sure. And it doesn't matter who's singing it. Uh, the version, there's two versions that I've usually hear. Uh, one by Michael, I guess the Jackson Five, and then by John Mellencamp. I saw mommy kissing Santa Claus. I hate that song. I don't care who does it. Yeah. It sucks. I'm not a fan. I. It's just a weird song to me. I, I don't really care about this version. I don't know who you're trying to appeal to. To what the the nudge and a wink? <laughs> yes, uh, maybe that's what Daddy likes to dress up as. I asked. Yeah, it's I, a bit weird. Yeah, I hate that. Uh, I ha- I asked my wife the same question. What's her favorite? What's her least favorite? I knew what her favorite would be, and of course, it's Mariah Carey. She just loves that. And then I didn't think she'd even have anything, but she was so quick. Like, what's your least favorite? And she goes, "Santa baby." <laughs> Which I guess is sort of sexualizing so, from the other way. I kind of like like the original old school Santa Baby with like Marilyn Monroe. It works. It fits the time. It's I don't like it because it's so commercialist and just um, it, it, and there's a lot of problems with it, but. I hate the current rendition. Like, stop singing this song and stop expecting them to buy you. Though, did you see um, Miley Cyrus's version of it la- last year, two years ago? Uh, she basically no, said, Santa baby, fuck off, I can buy my own stuff. Oh, is this, is, is this like that. Uh, female empowerment, is it? This is woke? Yeah, you know, I was like, well, you're taking a song that's very problematic to begin with, and you're turning it into something cute and funny, basically saying, whatever, I'm going to buy my own stuff. Hmm. Okay, I, I, I guess, you know what, I never really listened to the whole lyrics of that, so I didn't really sort of pick up on that. Oh, Santa Baby is basically, give me a whole lot of shit. 
I want a sable, which is a fur for those oh, who that, don't know. I, I thought um, she was I just want a diamond with ring. Them. I want a car. I want a platinum mine. I want a boat. Like, it's just give me, give me, give me, give me all the stuff. Hmm. So it's not even sexualizing Santa. It's just turning him into a sugar daddy. See, I just assumed it was because I never even listened to the lyrics on that. It just, it just, it's just the sick kind of, uh, not sick, what's the word I'm looking for? The half sultry. baby, I want a yacht, and really that's not hmm. a lot. Yeah. I'll close yeah, with basically, this. Yeah, basically, she just wants all the stuff. Next week, I guess it's back to me. So we could go one of three ways and I'm going to look, so I've got three ideas in my head and I'm going to let you sort of like decide this. Uh Oh, okay. I'm ready. Candidate number one is someone who's not technically a one hit wonder. 1992, who I imagine a preteen Andrea might've had a crush on. And if she didn't, she would say yes to dating him now. Because he's massively successful, but not for music. Candidate number two, 1986 or 87, a band I love, but they finally went number one with something that nobody remembers, a shitty, cheesy ballad. Or candidate number three. Do we look at the power of film and, so, and something from a soundtrack? And I got one in mind from 1983. That's tough. I'm going to go with candidate number one, Kirk. Thought, thought you might. Well, 1992, Andrea, did you have good vibrations? <laughs> Okay, but that's, that's um, Beach Boys, Good Vibration. No, not this. Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch. <laughs> I still refer to Mark Wahlberg as Marky Mark. Okay. No matter what. But am I correct? Still Marky Mark in my heart. Well, so maybe I was correct. Marky Mark. At age 49, super successful. Oh, I'd do him, for sure. I kind of thought you were, I, weren't, I didn't think you were going to be this blunt, but <laughs> I, I, I've actually been trying to hold back. I think people listening may not think, may wonder if this is me holding back. What the hell am I really like? <laughs> but yes, okay. Um, no, I definitely had a, had a crush on Marky Mark. I knew it! For sure. Um, like, he's still the sexier Wahlberg brother. I, I think it'll be really interesting to sort of, this is another one, and I feel like this is also a trend, where I just got it wrong. I never would have thought in 1992 that this guy would be not a great actor, but one of the most successful. But a successful one. And it would have done a whole ton of films I actually like, including one I absolutely love. I'll save that for next week. All right. I look forward to it. Oh, well, what's the song, though? Hmm? What's the song? It's Good Vibrations. Oh, Good Vibrations, It's of such course. a good vibration. It's such a sweet sensation. Yes. All right. I'm on it. So, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm going to pat myself on the back because not once have I ever asked you in all the time I've known you, hey, Andrea, what's your type? I don't know why I would ever ask that. <laughs> oh, it's all over the map, Kirk. Okay. Well, I think it really maybe that's going to like increase that whole male-female total that we've been talking about because we'll all find <laughs> out what's Andrea Tessman's type and are you it? Oh, dear. Well, Kirk, I would like to wish you a very Merry Christmas. Happy Holidays. Happy Hanukkah. Mm -hmm. um, Kwanzaa. Whatever, whatever holidays that you are celebrating right now. For me, it's the same thing I do every Christmas Day. 
My wife works all day and I get drunk watching basketball. Five games in a row, baby. I love it. <laughs> nice. All right. Stay safe. Thank you all so much for listening. Look for a lot more content from us regularly at notinhalloffame.com. Stay safe, everyone. 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 Everyone.